I tell a lot of people, I think I'm probably one of the least likely guys uh, that would have ended up as a football coach. I, I wasn't expecting, um, I didn't go into it that way. Long story short, um, you know, grew up, I had an older brother who played football. Uh, I played football. We had uh, you know, five sisters and, and uh, my mom had passed away uh, when I was eight years old and my dad was an attorney and, and he, he, one of the best moves I've ever seen in my life, my dad actually moved his practice into his house to raise his family um, uh, after we went through those hard times. And so I was able to see him. Now, he coached me when I was younger, but, but you know, only from the Pop Warner point of view. And, and when I talk about this is the greatest influence, and it, it's always my dad and, and the teachings because of those times that, that he had. So anyway, long story short, I, I wanted to be a lawyer because my dad was a lawyer and I just wanted to be just like him. So I went to school for law, um, played in Grange, Connecticut, uh, really a strong football program. Coach Mike Ornato, a uh, slew of state championships, Steve Young, uh, Tony Bell, uh, really, really good football program specifically for for the Northeast New England uh, brand of football. And um, played there, played center. I was, it was the last stop before the bus stop. I was um, not athletic, uh, and I say that with all sincerity. I, I wasn't uh, the, the biggest guy. I wasn't the most athletic guy. Certainly wasn't a great athlete. Um, was a great teammate, probably the best teammate, and was tough and, and uh, surrounded by some great coaches. So um, from there, I went to Ithaca. That's where my college coach went, Mike Ornato, and played at, at, at Ithaca as well. They were it was the highest level I could play and actually play, which is basically why, why I chose it. And, and uh, back then, Coach Butterfield, Hall of Fame, National Hall of Fame coach, uh, was taking teams apart with split back beer and uh, just came off his third national championship. And we just came from a program that won state championships my junior year and senior year, predominantly running the ball and, and playing great defense. Same recipe that we have at St. Thomas today. I went to Ithaca and, like I said, was getting ready to – I go to law school, and uh, after my last game, my dad kind of grabbed me by the proverbial ear and said, what are you doing? And I said, what do you mean, what am I doing? I'm going to go to law school, come home, take over the practice, live a good life. He goes, look, my dad now passed away 15 years ago um, last month. But unbelievable guy, never missed an opportunity to teach. He said, look, he said, I get up 6 o'clock every day. I get out of bed. I jump out of bed. I am passionate about what I do, passionate about the law, just like Grandpa Rocco would get out of bed, and he was passionate about being a mason. Um, he said, you, he said, your passion's different, man. You're into developing people, growing cultures, uh, building things. He said, your football is in, is in your heart. He said, I think you need to get as far away from here as you possibly can and go figure out who you are. And it was kind of a go West young man meets up with uh, don't trade on my name. Cause he knew I could have come home and lived in, in Grange, Connecticut and, and had a good, comfortable life. And so basically uh, if you take, if you guys take every town in the United States and you put them on a continuum, the complete opposite of Greenwich, Connecticut is Fargo, North Dakota. And that's exactly where my Volkswagen landed back in 1992. <laughs> First time I ever went on the internet um, was in January of 97 when I decided, okay, dad said, go coach somewhere, get away from here. So I hop on the internet. The very first image I ever remember seeing on the internet is I popped up North Dakota State, and a picture came up with all the, tr the national championship trophies on it. That's the first time I ever went on the internet. We didn't have it in college. We didn't use it in college. Wow. And um, I said, you know what? That's where I want to go. Went out, uh, drove my little Volkswagen out there, lived in someone's basement, made $240 a month, and you know, shopped at Cheap Foods where dents make sense, and went to a ground round taco night where you could buy a beer every Tuesday, Thursday, and, and uh, eat the taco bar for free. So... I just soaked it up, loved it, spent seven years out there, had an unbelievable time, got to coach different positions, got to coordinate uh, the offense, but most importantly was around some amazing people and and then, uh, you know, started the journey that everyone else goes through, right? So I went to uh, South Dakota, University of South Dakota, was blessed to be around some unbelievable people there, great players, great people, and then that's sort of where we, uh, we hit a crossroads, the first major crossroads of, of our career and and that was where uh, my dad was dying. Uh, Anna Marie, our oldest, was being born. And as I go home to talk to dad and, and spend the last few weeks with him, he's on his deathbed and once again gives me an unbelievable lesson and, and great vision. And he says, Glenn, uh, now at the time, all of our, we were pretty good. 
So when we were in South Dakota, I was coordinating the offense. We were about 50 points a game, 600 yards a game. Uh, very balanced, run and run pass. And everybody else was going off to, to the big schools and the fancy schools, and they'd have their press conferences and say where they're going. And, and I'd have my press conference, and I said, <clears throat> I'm going to McAllister College, and everyone thought I fell off my rocker. Uh, but at the time, we were just looking for something that was an enormous challenge. I, I was mm. – I was sharing, you know, Brady with you the other day about being on a bus ride home, uh, having won 77 to nothing and racking up 800 yards offense or whatever it was and just kind of feeling a little bit empty and, and looking for a big challenge. And you know what? I found it in McAllister. So that was my first head coaching job. Spent a couple of years there. And then 13 years ago, this job at St. Thomas opened up and, and we always knew what it could possibly be. We, we thought it was a, a great fit for us. And it appears to be so. That's a uh, that, that's an, an awesome story, um, and and uh, you know obviously not not one that like you said many coaches will take when it's when it's going so easily or going so well for them uh, right. for them to make the decision to go to a place that's going to be a little bit tougher for them. I mean, uh, you just that's literally all that it came down to was. Uh, you you wanted a challenge, and and so you made that decision. We wanted basically two things. They, yeah, that's that's one of them, and the other one was, you know, Anna Marie's being born, and we loved. Let, let me make this abundantly clear. We loved our time at every stop and enjoyed it. Like could see us living there for a long period of time, but you know, Anna Marie's being born. We're in the hospital. I'm sitting in that little Barca lounger, and you're holding this thing this person that's only seven pounds, four ounces, but it feels like the weight of the world because of your responsibility. And um, you realize at the time that, that I, you know, we wanted to find a place where we were going to be able to raise our kids. And my dad had sacrificed tremendously for our family and our family and our family's family, our kids, kids, they reap those rewards now because of his sacrifice. And I felt in a day and an age all the more devoted to style over substance and a job that was really um, transient that I wanted to be able, we, my wife, Rachel, and I wanted to be able to give our, our kids a place where they could go back home for holidays and go be married and go be buried. And, and we all deserve to have, I, I was fortunate enough to have those roots. Why shouldn't my kids have them? So that night that she was born, we took out a map and listening to dad's advice and we drew three or four circles on that map, and one of them was the Twin Cities, and, and it came down to looking for a huge challenge and finding a place that we could put down roots. And like I said, it's it's been a blessing, the good and the bad. The journey's been awesome. Well, I was going to say, you know, and, and didn't want to get too personal or away from football, but as soon as you, you know, you talk about your mom, uh, you know, passing away, and yep. the first thing I could think of was, uh, you know, your dad at that time. It was think of, of me as a dad, and and I'm so heavily into, you know, coaching, as I'm sure he was into into law, uh, such a big, you know, takes so much time up. And now you've got your kids, like you said, now, now you're the only one that, that is now taking care of your kids. And, and he had to move so many things around to be able to do that. I mean, what an unbelievable challenge. And I'm sure it ended up being, um, you know, great for, for everyone that, that he got to be around you guys. But what a challenge that must have been for him to go through that and just lost his wife, obviously. No question. And, and there's a lot of levels to that and a lot of layers, but at the end of the day, yeah, it was difficult. Um, but as I'm sure we'll get to sometime in this podcast, uh, you know, it, the easy way is, is not the worthy way. E easy is a four letter word. So if you're looking for something that's easy, you're setting yourself up for tremendous failure. We'll get to that later. But um, if you look at it through this lens and the older I get, um, as amazing as the job that he did is, what I realized is he was living out his passion. And that's, you know, we'd say pride and passion all the time. And, and uh, it's not just a tagline. If you find something that is your passion, then you will be willing to go to the ends of the earth at all extents to make sure that that, that thing thrives and lives and grows. And what a lot of people, when I think they, they look at the job my dad did, because he, without a doubt, he has more of an imprint on this football program than anybody else, present company included. And he never even got a chance to see St. Thomas ever play a football game. But, but his passion was that his, his lessons will live on in the hearts of those he leaves behind. Literally, that, that's what's on his tombstone. 
to live on in the hearts of those we leave behind is not to die. That's what's on his dad's tombstone. And if you look at it through that lens, then it's a worthy cause, right? Because his priority was not the law. His priority was not making a million dollars. And his priority is not having a fancy house like, like all the neighbors have. His priority was raising kids that were going to be able to handle the tough times better than anybody else. And, and it was, um, yeah, was it difficult? Sure, it was, it was difficult. But I think if he was living right now and he was on this podcast with us, by the way, he would have loved the podcast. But I think if he was on the podcast with us, You'd probably say, you know what, it was worth every bit of it, and then some. And I think that's that's why you have to find your passion, or else you're just selling yourself short. Coach, I know you and I have kind of reconnected and been able to talk a little bit, and and we we kind of had a little bit of a list here, and I'm I'm looking at it, and and literally you've touched on on all those things. But I mean, you know, for me, it's, yeah, it's enjoy it's, your podcast, guys. Have a wonderful day. <laughs> <laughs> um, You've, you've hit on family, you know, the, the importance of family and, and, you know, not only your family, but I would imagine that's got to be one of the pillars of, you know, being successful at St. Thomas and all the other stops you've been and, and being able to build a program that way. So can you talk a little bit about how you've kind of created that family atmosphere? I would say, number one, obviously, you're living it. You know, it's, it's the example that I think you try to set for your kids. But how is that now trickling down into all the young men who've been in your program now for all these years? Well, I mean, that boy, there's, there's a lot to that one, right? I think um, we decided to start this whole journey because we wanted to be able to use, utilize, however you say it, football to teach life's lessons. I mean, when we say coach football for life, it doesn't mean that's, that's how I feed my family. It doesn't mean that's my profession. It's literally, can you utilize this sport that if you're listening to this and this grovelly old voice 16 minutes in or whatever it is right now, you must love it. If you have been given something by the sport, then you owe it. You owe it to everyone else who's come before to pass it along to someone else. And that's, that's how we always, always looked at football is as a means to an end, as a medium to be able to teach. Um, and I'm not saying I'm not, a, I, I love football. I'm, I'm, it's, it's awesome, but um, it, at the core of it, it's about what we can learn and how we can grow to be better human beings. And um, so that's how we, we run our program. And uh, I think when, when people get to know me, you know, it's interesting because people think like I'm a big sports guy. I'm not a big sports guy. My wife's a big sports guy. I'm, I'm not a big sports guy. I'm a big mental toughness guy. I'm a big, uh, human um, integration, uh, psychology, like those are the things that I, I, I really get cranked up about. So people think that um, our program is about the wins and the success and the national recognition and the notoriety and all those types of things. And if you ever take the time to pull the curtain back and spend some time getting to know our players, our coaching staff, our culture, you'll realize that it is those lessons. And I think sometimes when people spend the week with us or maybe they just spend a day with us or whatever it is, they're always like, huh, not exactly what I thought. And I say, well, what did you think? And they always think it's about all the other stuff. And it's about that process of how we can wake up every single day, get your mind right, and then go to work for someone or something else that's bigger than you are. Because if we don't get that now, I tell our kids this all the time, if we don't understand that now, it's not really the end of the world. Because if you don't understand that when you're 18 years old, you know what happens? You miss the sack, you drop the post, whatever, right? But if you don't understand that, when you got a wife and three kids and a mortgage and a big boy job, that's when we got some issues. So that's kind of how we, we look at football. Do, do we have success? Yes. But let me be abundantly clear. The success is the byproduct of the process. Don't get that one. Well, Coach, and, and, and Coach Walls talked about, you know, family. He had that written down, and, and that's one of the things a lot of times in college football that most of the time uh, I kind of roll my eyes at because I had a bunch of college coaches come through when I was in college, and I had four different offensive line coaches and three head coaches, and, 
And at the time they would all come in and say, Hey, we're a family. I care about you guys like my family. And then when they left, they would say, Hey, you guys got to understand, uh, you know, I'm leaving because my family needs me to go make more money here at wherever. Right. So, so the cool thing to me when, when I hear your story is you talk about a coach that, that, uh, is, you know, preaching that part of it family, but has also been at that school for, you know, 10 plus years, someone that actually is treating it like if it, so if I'm a kid coming in, I can actually say, well, okay, he's not just, you know, lip service, which is what I normally think of when I hear that. This is a guy that, that I'm sure has had plenty of opportunities to do other things, but is staying here with, you know, his family, at least from the past 10 years. Yeah, and, and I appreciate you bringing that up because that's something that you know, we talk about that exact thing in recruiting all the time. Uh, I might not have the, the most alluring recruiting pitch, but I'll tell you what, it's honest and it's straightforward and you're welcome for it. Um, but the word family is so trite and is so overused, it often makes me sick when it's used the wrong way. It's like the word literally huge pet peeve. I don't mind if you use the word literally, but use it right. <laughs> it literally blew my mind. No, it figuratively blew me. It did not literally blow your mind. <laughs> Same situation with family. If you live it and you understand it. So when people say, well, what are you talking about? I say, well, think, of, just think of it through this way. For us, the, the word family is, it, it's an acronym, stands for forget about me. I love you. We have three basic acronyms. That's one of them. Who, what we decide to leave, who we choose to love, what we leave behind. That's the matter one, what we who we decide to love. Um, and, and look, that acronym is not indigenous to us. I know a lot of people use it. I'm proud that, that, um, that they do in, in the right way. But I will say this. We took over a program that was <clears throat> two and eight. And when we took that program over 12 years ago, um, we did a lot of things really quickly that everyone started paying attention to. We went first couple of years, we went seven and three, 11 and two, 12 and one, 13 and one. We went from number 200 and something in the country to number four or five in the first four years. And it was not intended to be that quick. I promise you that. And so we're sitting on the precipice. I had a pretty good four year plan. I had no idea what I was going to do for year five because, you know, you're a football coach. So it's like forever, four years of school. <laughs> but what I realized was all of the things that we knew we had to do to turn a program and sustain the program. And we did that from day one with that thought process of can we make it sustainable? It was all done um, based on a lot of different factors, right? So in the first four years, yes, we got the right coaches on board. We got the right players on board. We were able to get the facilities. The facilities came and, you know, all the other stuff, the national recognition, the wins, the win streaks, all that stuff. Our reputation preceded us. And, and that's great. But we were at a point where we needed something that was not quantifiable. And the idea of family was so ridiculously simple and just what we needed going into year five. We had just graduated seven All-Americans, seven All-Americans from our very first recruiting class. Jeez. And we're, yeah, right. And we're sitting there saying, how in God's green one are we going to get any better? And we actually went to our very first national championship. That was that next year. And it was nothing more than a vow of selflessness. If, if I really believe in family and I understand, forget about me, I love you, then all we're saying is we're making a conscious choice. We're making an effort, a vow of selflessness to put someone or something before us. It has nothing to do with the buildings. We built a $58 million building, really awesome. We put in the Jumbotron. We had the 30-game win streak. We had you know, all that stuff. But it was so simple to be able to, to want to sacrifice at a level so deep. And when you have children, you'll know exactly what I mean when you have your first one, that it would hurt you more if one of your family members were hurting than if it were you hurting. And that was a premise that my dad raised his family on. So let me ask you this. Let's say we're all playing on the same football team. Let's say Rowdy's my starting center, and let's say Brady's my starting inside linebacker. Neither one of you, I don't think, are athletic enough to play the perimeter. So we'll play those roles right now, right? <laughs> Good call. So let's, be, let's be honest. One of you should be a guard, I guess, if we're on RTP. Right? But let's say we're on the same team. If until the point in time comes 
where we can delineate between needs and wants, my favorite thing to talk about right now, needs and wants, then we're gonna, we're gonna be all off sorts. So if Rowdy, and I don't care how good he is or isn't, if he has a need and Brady has a want, and those human beings are on, in our football culture, you tell me who should win that when that comes to a head. Rowdy. Rowdy, every day of the week. And you know what? When Brady has a need and Glenn Caruso, even though he's a head coach, has a want, who should win that one? Coach Walls. Every day of the week. Until we're willing to put everybody's needs before anybody's wants, you don't have a family. But let me tell you what. Once you are willing to do that, you have earned the right to call yourself a family. And we are blessed beyond what we deserve to have that at St. Thomas. Coach, absolutely love it, 100%. Um, you talked also a little bit about, you know, kind of the, the human nature. So, I mean, talking about, you know, getting kids to understand that, getting kids to, you know, to learn some of those things, especially being in a, a selfish world where a lot of them are, are super, super used to, you know, being pampered, being told how many stars they have, being told how good they are, you know, right. being the best player on their team. You know, how do you start to kind of dig into some of that, you know, psychology, maybe, you know, not really necessarily breaking down the kid, but teaching them and getting them to understand that you are going to have to sacrifice a little bit in order to have the success that we want to have here. It starts as early as it possibly can. <clears throat> um, you know, I, I, when people ask that question, I usually liken it to um, when we taught our, our kids, we got three kids, Anna Marie, 10th grade, Kate's in eighth grade, True is in sixth grade. And we teach them to read. And I started, we started teaching them to read when they were like age one. Now, not because I'm trying to come up with some child prodigy, but it's never too early teach a lesson. You just have to have faith and patience knowing that the answers won't come until that other person's ready, right? So, you know, it's, it's the same. There's never too early a time to start demonstrating and living your mission with a football program. So recruiting, we, we have, like, that's what I said. When I say it's not the sexiest recruiting pitch, that's what I'm telling you. I'm not a, a fancy looking guy. I don't have a, a fancy vocabulary. I'm not the smartest guy in the world, <laughs> but I'll tell you exactly who we are and who we're not really clearly. Because if a kid is going to quit on us proverbially, it, it can be, his junior or high school, it can be when you're deciding whether or not to come to St. Thomas, but it absolutely cannot and will not be on fourth and one. I promise you that. So if we're going to join into this relationship, we better start that on the front end. And you know what? It's amazing at how resilient people are and how much kids want to hear the truth. Now, you may face uh, resistance that's that's life right the, of, of teaching people but at the end of the day it it rejuvenates every day my belief in humanity when I am able to see kids just want to be shot straight just just give me the honest truth and so you know we'll, we'll start this as early as the kid is willing to you know respond to a text or come on campus on a visit and um, now I will say this a tip of the, the cap to the high school coaches that are that are listening to this. And I'm not trying to be self-deprecating and cute. I don't know if I could do, I know I could do what we do the way we do it at the highest of levels. There's zero doubt in my mind in football. I don't know if I could do it um, in, in, in some of the lower levels at the high school level, because I, I'm fortunate enough to be able to choose the people that, that populate our program. And obviously through recruiting. And I don't know if I would have uh, the mental toughness or, or the wherewithal. I consider myself a really mentally tough dude. But the high school coaches are the ones who, in my opinion, make the most effect in anybody's life because they're taking the plot that is given to them and they're, they're forced to cultivate it. So that's the beginning of the process. Um, and then certainly it's an everyday thing. I mean, this is not like some big seminar that we have to talk about this stuff. 
and then we forget about it. We don't even talk about it in a huge seminar. It's just the way that you live your life every single day. And, you know, I'm reading this really cool book. It's called, you can't see it, but I'm holding it up in front of my computer. It's called Fail Fast and Often, right? We need more failure in our lives. We need more risk, appropriate levels of risk. We need more uh, loss so we can learn. And it says in here, right on page 13, it talks about passion and, and why passion breeds curiosity, why curiosity, like childlike curiosity is such a beautiful thing. But then it says, it's not the size of the progress that is important, but the frequency. And I think that that's important. It's, it's not trust or, or belief is not something that is one big sweeping uh, action. It's created over time through little data points of things that happen. And, and that's how culture is built. It's not some rousing speech that I can give to the team. Matter of fact, if you listen to our pregame speech, you'd probably be underwhelmed. I learned that from Coach Osborne. It's not some uh, meme or, or snippet that you can put on social media. It's how you live your life. And in the end, all you can hope for is they come to your funeral saying, you know what? You lived a pretty good life. That's it. Coach, you've mentioned, you know, a couple of times, obviously you got to grow up in the, the NDSU, you know, annals and all the, the national championships they've won. And you've also talked about, you know, Coach Osborne and, and honestly the run that they had, I think in the 90s might not be duplicated, especially, I mean, I guess you, you could venture to say some of the big time coaches, you know, but to me, that's a whole different beast. They're getting, they're getting guys uh, around the rules. Let's just put it that way. Um, Anyway, we talk about those, those types of programs, you know, the, the 90s Nebraska, the NDSU program that's now won all these national titles, you know, what are snippets that you've taken from them? What are they, what have they done or what are they doing better than anybody else? And heck, I'm going to throw your program in there as well, knowing you guys use a lot of those principles to go 110 and, and 17 over these 13 year stretch. What are these principles? What are these small st snippets that these guys have figured out better than maybe anybody else to have this prolonged success? Belief in what you know and adjusting to what you don't. Like ridiculously simple, man. When I look at those teams from Nebraska, and there's always some points. I mean, you know, it, <clears throat> I promise you, I was the only guy that grew up in Connecticut a Cornhusker fan, like no, that I was, it was laughable, right? But <laughs> the, 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 very, <laughs> the very first game I can ever remember watching with that was on our little 13 inch black and white Philco that was in his den. And it was the 1983 Orange Bowl game, which was technically played January 1, 1984. And I still have that video on VHS today. Doherty was doing the play-by-play, -play and they score at the end of the game, and Doherty's on there saying, oh, if they just kick the PAT and they tie, this is back for you young people. This is back when they actually would tie football games in college. If they tie, he'll win the national championship. It's unbelievable to go back and watch that. Dean Steinkohler picks up the fumble ruski and runs it in from 26 yards out. Just wicked cool stuff, right? And Coach Osborne goes for two and runs the play action power pass out of a 21 personnel off to the right and tries to throw it out in the flat and, you know, to number 28, it gets tipped and, and you guys know all, all the rest. Well, that's the game that drew me to loving a culture like that. And I said, Dad, I'm, I don't know how young, I'm 10 years old at the time or something like that, right? Eight years old, I guess. And I said, why didn't he just kick the PAT? And my dad, very simply, said, Glenn, the winners always go for the win. Well, I watched that program grow, and, and certainly they had those, those points where, you know, they couldn't overcome the, the, the Miami teams, and any Cornhusker fan went through those frustrations where basically the Orange Bowl was a home game for, for those Florida teams. And, and then along came 1994, right? And you look at 1994, so if, if, we're, if we're being honest and we're saying, hey, you're a real old line guy, you show me a cooler offensive line, and, and maybe this is it's a competition for you, but I'm talking about Rob, uh, you know, you got, you got 
Aaron Graham, you got Stai, you got you got Uyghur, you got uh, Rob Zateka. I mean, and I'm forgetting one guy. I'm sorry if you're listening. But, you know, you got this O line that is just as beefy and as corn fed as as anyone's ever seen, right? And you you have that that moment where here we go again. They're going up against Kennard Lang and Warren Sapp and Ray Lewis and all the rest of the all the rest of the guys that thwarted their dreams all in the prior years. And you got this little guy, Makavica, running trap in the fourth quarter, walk on from I don't know where, nowhere. And, uh, you know, meanwhile, you got, you got Sap running upfield, and they actually flipped the two guards that week in bowl season because they knew they couldn't block him anyway, so they were just looking for the guy to get beat by. And you got Joel Makavica or whatever his name running in for touchdowns and it was just kind of a really neat reminder of if you do things long enough and well enough that you might not get everything you want when you want it but in time it just made everything feel right and I reflected on that about two weeks ago when we started getting quarantined because I actually that's when I think I really started loving football and those were the first games that I diagrammed were, were those old Nebraska games. And, and whether you're talking Nebraska or North Dakota state or, uh, you know, De La Salle high school out in California uh, or, or any of the, the many phenomenal programs out there, they have a very strong belief in what they know, but they're also understanding that whatever comes their way, they're not going to be so rigid that they can not adjust they're going to be pliable no matter what. And those stalwart thoughts are why I love football and why you're able to be great. You can't be great just being stalwart in all sports, but in football, you definitely can. That's an awesome story. I, I, I must be too young on the young side. I didn't realize uh, there was a game uh, they could have won it and go for the tie and, and tried to win the game. So uh, Man, I love are hearing you, are that. You are I'm, you serious? I'm completely serious. <laughs> man you go google this is that's ridiculous you go google 1984 it's the 1983 season like i said uh orange bowl and it's it's howard schnellenberger oh unbelievable stuff and um and, and coach osborne and you look at some of the guys that are on that that field that was um, if you are a fan of of authentic, good old 1980s football, that is as good as it gets. That game has defined my thought process probably as much as any. And I got to tell you, here's the follow up. When we were at NDSU, Bob Babbage was our head coach. He's now with the Bills. Unbelievable guy. I mean, the staff was was phenomenal. Bob was our head coach. I was our offensive coordinator. Our defensive coordinator was. Casey Bradley, who uh, Gus was, I don't know where he is right now. He's the, the Jaguars coach for a long period of time. Todd Wash was our D-line coach. He's, he's now with the Jaguars. Uh, Andy Rondo, I mean, just some, some unbelievable guys. And I was in charge of the clinic that we had to put on when I was a 23-year-old uh, coach, right? And this was right when Coach Osborne had won it uh, split the national championship in 97 and then was going to go run for governor or senator. I, I apologize for not knowing which one. I think it was like congressman or senator. Something like that. And they, we had a tie on the staff to uh, Nebraska at the time. And so he goes, Glenn, I think I'm going to be able to get coach, coach Babbage said, I'm going to be able to get coach Osborne to come in. And like my world went like silent. It was unbelievable. Cause <laughs> I was, I was the guy that like, Got to pick him up at the airport and got to set everything up. And, and he's like, are you going to be able to take him out to dinner? At the, and I was like, oh, my goodness. So we sit there and we're actually at the Holiday Inn which is in Fargo, which is like the nicest Holiday Inn in the country, which I understand is like being the tallest mountain in the state of Iowa. But still, it was a really, really nice place with a nice restaurant. And we're sitting there and it's just me and him. And I was like paralyzed, right? And he's eating salmon. <laughs> And I'll never forget it. This guy that I put on a pedestal for so long, he's eating salmon and he can't get the piece of salmon on the fork, right? And he keeps stabbing it, it's flaking apart. So finally he just grabs a piece of salmon, puts it on his fork and sticks it in his mouth. And I'm sitting here in my mind, I'm like, oh my goodness, 
Coach Osborne just touched food with his hands and he put it on the fork. Like you shouldn't do that. Like I had him at, I had him at this unattainable level. <laughs> and and I said, um, I said, Coach, you know, after we really got into it, and I said, Coach, I got to ask you one question. And this is almost verbatim. I got to ask you one question. And he said, Let me guess, the two point conversion. And I said, Yep, that's it. And I told him my story and my dad's story and what he said. And he put his fork down. He goes, Glenn, it, it was as simple as this. I was not about ready to go back into that locker room and look our players in the eye and not give them every opportunity to win a football game. It was as simple as that. And just um, spoke wow. volumes about his stoicism and his belief in those people in the room. And the legacy he left is because of that belief and the belief of so many others. This is like a promotional fee paid for by like <laughs> Corn Oscar football or something. My goodness. <laughs> I, I've been, you know, studying it too, coach. I mean, it's, it's funny you say that, you know, for, for a couple of weeks. And again, you just, he was such an unassuming guy. And, and, you know, it's been so long for a lot of us as Husker fans, you know, since we've been, you know, nationally relevant and people like to rub it in your face because, you know, hey, you were good for a long time and, and people, yeah, hey, that's fine. But I, I mean, I was reading something about him too, talking about like how he loved the walk-on program because I mean, he liked it for two reasons. One was he said, you know, volunteers will fight harder than mercenaries. So, you know, the guys that want to be there, the guys that volunteered to be into the program. And just like you'd said, you know, Hey, if the guys are going to quit on us, let's have them quit on us early and we don't have to worry about them when they get into our program. And then the second thing he, he loved about it was those quote mercenaries that they brought in those walk-ons, their attitude and their love and their passion and their work ethic all started to, in his words, permeate the locker room. And all those guys started to kind of buy in like, yeah, this is why this is a special place. So to me, it's like, God, something that simple, the, the culture of the locker room, you know, understanding the psychology of how people quote fight and work and, and have that passion like you were talking about before. That's the good stuff. And you also said the same thing about, you know, hey, guys will come in and clinic yeah, hey, you know, sorry it wasn't all the guru stuff and the, you know, the, the X's and O's and things that you might have, quote, wanted. But we'll go back on another thing you said. That's the stuff they needed. And I think a lot of people need that. Amen. And you know what? Everybody, and, and I'll just say this and then I'll go back to the initial question. Everybody who mentions that walks away with exactly the same mindset of what you said. <clears throat> I, I, I thought I was... You know, I thought I was hunting for elk and I was hunting for deer. Like they don't even know, you don't even know what you're, what you're not looking for until you embrace the idea of what the sport can give to everybody that you're responsible for. But going back to the, <clears throat> I, you know, the, the walk on thing is interesting. Um, you know, you hear the term all the time, PWO. It, it's, it's just different now. The whole landscape of football is different and this is not relative, but you know, I, I think as I reflect back on why so many people look to, excuse me, the great walk-on programs, whether it be his um, or whether it be, uh, you know, Wisconsin, they've done a, a wonderful job for so many years. You know, some of it, like any other great invention, is probably done out of necessity, right? It's a necessity of mother of invention. Because in a state that doesn't have 30 million people in it, but only has 5 million or 2 million or 1 million, um, it's tough to just go out there and recruit in the manner that everybody else does. But I think, I think what it brings to the locker room in terms of diversity is something that should not be dismissed, nor could it be overstated. When you have diverse experiences and backgrounds in your locker room, it provides everybody with a more global view of everything. And a tolerance for when you bring a kid in who grew up in a town of maybe 200 kids, there's a lot of people who his experiences are going to help shape how other people in that locker room will not only look at things, but work for things maybe, right? I mean, that's, we're all, we're all a compilation of the people in our lives and the experiences that we have. That's it. It's really simple. So those old walk-on programs, I think really, um, really allowed him to define his culture and then he embraced it right and then it's like okay i'm not going to try and be someone i'm not because i know i'm not going to have the number one 
Rivals program on the first Wednesday in February, which is what uh, he's going to be like number 62 in terms of, of ranking, but it's how you build things. You know, we've all seen or heard uh, people talk about, you know, he grew up on third base, he hit a single, he thinks he hit a home run. It's not where you start, it's how you grow and when you finish. And um, that's why that's why I was drawn to those types of players. But, uh, you know, that's, that's my belief. Now, hold on a second, because while, I mean, we got the internet here. I'm, I'm like the oldest one of you people. And if I could do this, you could do this. But I'm going to share, we're on Zoom. Boy, I wish I bought Zoom stock like some time ago, right? So I think our listeners might be able to hear. <laughs> here you go, Hart. Turner Gill, Jeff Smith. Can you hear this, guys? No, Don't I can't. I can't hear it on our end. <laughs> but I can see it. Todd Osborne made this decision a long time ago. Snellenberger on the other side, standing cross-armed. They lined up, tight end left, one back in the backfield, Turner Gill under center, rolls out right, fake, throws it, knocked away. Miami goes crazy. Tom Osborne goes back to work. Google it, guys. You'll love it. I definitely will be. I'll be. I'll be watching it. I, I love the story. I, it was uh, eight years before I was born, but um, I'm glad. I'm glad I know about it now. Yeah, don't, don't don't throw that at me like you're a young millennial. I <laughs> can do things I can't. The internet actually, you know, shows us things before we're born. You can check it out. <laughs> that's classic. I think that's the first ever uh, first ever video we've actually had uh, on live on RTP. You know how. Seriously, how blessed are we that we have the opportunity to communicate in the manner we do in a time like this, right? I mean, it, it forget about learning how to, to run a blitz or learning how to grow your football program. If you think about the confidence in true or good information that, that is now available to so many people when we're in a, in, in a mitigated state of quarantine or whatever you want to call it, um, it's, it's an absolute blessing. And I do believe it's why most people are staying in the same same mind frame now is is because of that coach looking at you know a little bit maybe of some x's and O's stuff i know you've prided yourself on you know being able to run the ball and also being a balanced offense whenever you have been you know a, a coordinator can you talk a little bit about kind of you know your philosophy your mentality obviously starting with the run game and then building from there as you build a lot of these great offenses. Sure, no doubt. I mean, everything we do, uh, I'm a math guy, so everything falls into a matrix, right? And everything we do as an offense or a defense or special teams will fall into a matrix. So if you looked at our matrix, <clears throat> we always develop the run plays first, not because I was an unathletic guy that played center, not because I, uh, I really like power or whatever it is, but simply because I want our offensive line to know that it's core of what we do like our O-line is a microcosm of what our program is there is no other position group. again I love that, all positions we have but there is no other position group that demonstrates what I ask of everybody whether it's our Caruso children or our St. Thomas football players on a daily basis in terms of selflessness thoughtfulness attitude working for each other and you know what you can be as great as you want to be if you're not working well with the dude next to you, chances are you're not going to be very productive football. So everything I want to revolve around the offensive line. And, and when you look at, it's so simple. If you look at the ways, let's draw, um, draw up a, in your mind a whiteboard and I, I got O's and you got X's. In general, guys, there is 12 ways that I can move my O's to block your X's, right? I can run inside zone, outside zone, an isolation scheme, veer it, gap it, wedge it, trap it, G it, boss it. Like there's only so many ways. And the answer to that number is 12. There are 12 ways that you can, within reason, move those O's to block those X's. So as I look at people that understand the run game and respect the run game, usually the litany of plays that is built off of a scheme 
involves less schemes and more plays because anybody can come in on Tuesday morning to a staff meeting and say, hey, I was watching Monday Night Football last night and I saw this great play and, and uh, I want to put it in, this great run play. Oh, okay, says the coordinator. You want to put it in? Well, then what are you going to take out? How is it going to fit into the, <laughs> how is it going to fit into the system? You want me to just, just make the, pull this one out of a hat? Like everything has to fit into a system and then ev- for us anyway everything emanates out, out from there by the way if you can come up with a 13th way i've been i've been posing this question for 21 years if you can come up with a 13th way uh let me know i'll buy you a pop so we take those 12 schemes and we say okay what are the five that we choose to run for whatever reason this year because of uh belief or talent or anything like that and Last year, let's say the schemes that we choose to run uh, last year is uh, an isolation scheme, an inside zone scheme, a half zone scheme, a toss scheme. You know, they're, they're, maybe this year we choose a T scheme, or maybe that, that year we, we choose a, uh, a counter trace scheme, an OT, a double pull, double load play, whatever it might be, uh, which, by the way, is not Power O. And, and Power O, anyone listening, uh, Power O, do not tell me it's called that because power offense. It's called that because when the letters were drawn up by Coach Bugle and some of the other greats that preceded us, the backside guard's letter was O. So it reflects the pulling of the backside guard, just like OT is counter track. So you, you pick your five schemes or whatever it is, four schemes, whatever you think you can absorb. Maybe you can only absorb one scheme. And then uh, within that is where you start to diversify. So. For us, every scheme that we have will have an attitude play to it, and it will have a finesse play to it. For instance, let's say that I am picking isolation. The scheme is isolation, right? I'm going to stay away from power because that's probably been overdone. So let's say I pick isolation. I know the rules to isolation. Tackles are on the outside, guards are on the inside, center's going to double the A-gap player to the backside linebacker. We're going to inside some insert some form of our level two guy on your level two and hopefully take one gap, call it an A-gap if you're playing with a strong side for tough two, and let's create an A-1 and an A-2, and let's have them fit it a different way, right? Simple. Um, so I might have a play within there that's ISO, right? But I also might have a play that's in there that's like draw. And a lot of people would say, whoa, man, what are you doing putting draw in isolation scheme? Well, I can morph it so that the rules are pretty much the same. My kick slide steps are gonna be different than my power steps should be in the neck of the guard, I get it. Uh, But the responsibilities are still gonna be tackles are on the outside, guards are on the inside, and we're gonna get that. Um, And the difference between those two is that the attitude play of that scheme is is ISO. And so the isolation scheme is what power is at the very core to you guys. It's a play that I'm going to call it. You know I'm going to call it. I know that you know that I'm going to call it. And my wife in the stands knows that I'm going to call power right now because the kids are going to say, I want to run gap. I want to run down. I want to run power. So it's a play where secrets are, are, are not really valued at a premium level. It's I'm doing my thing, you're doing your thing. And you know what, at the end of it, let's let the chips fall with a man, let's see who's better and run across the field and shake hands and then go ahead. Whereas the finesse version of whatever falls into that uh, scheme is gonna be different. The finesse version of that might be a draw play, which has the same rules, so our old line can have clear minds, but it's also going to be more finicky. Eh, it's a check play. I only want to run it to the open B gap. I only want to run it away from a tight end surface, whatever, blah, 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 whatever you decide, right? Which is why when you plot those two plays, they can average 6.5 yards for an entire season. But ISO is a hardier play. ISO might be a play that, you know what? It has... Uh, a lot of fours and fives and not a lot of eighties, but it, it has a sevens and it has fours and, and it's, it's standard deviation from the mean is minimal. Whereas draw might also average 6.5, 
but you might have a minus two because they blitzed the inside linebacker and I couldn't get the tight end with the pass action uh, through to that gap because I'm running out of one back or it hits for a big one. It's the same reason why when it's second and long and you're in the stands and you hear someone that doesn't even understand football and they say, hey, it's second and long. Watch the blank and blank. Fill in the blank. What are the two words they say? Second and long. Second and long. Draw screen. Watch your draws and watch the screens. Boy, I'm glad you got that one, or else you would have had to edit this whole thing out. That would have been really <laughs> bad, right? We would have just we just would have let it, let us sound stupid. We were all right with that. Watch the draw, watch it. Why? Well, it's obvious. I mean, we don't explain it, but if you're a Malcolm Gladwell guy, you understand human nature because I'm already back on the chains. So I've got to take on more risk and have a more finicky play because I am down on the chains because I didn't do my work on first down. So that's where those plays, they might average the same amount of yards per play, but they have a higher risk, high reward, which I have to take on because I'm chips down. Make sense? Yes, completely. Yes. Cool. I like it. Yeah, I, I, I'm completely with you. My, my big one has always been, Coach, and, and hopefully you've got a little insight into it. My play that I've wanted to put in or, or we've slightly put in the past four years has been trap, but it's been my finicky play, and maybe it shouldn't be. Maybe it should be the the uh, play that constantly gets you what you need. But to me, you know, for our gap scheme is we're going to run power, and we run it into every front. We've got a thousand different ways it seems like to block it, depending on the front. So we've got answers. Um, and but as much as we double that three technique, we yeah. want to be able to trap them. Um, and it's almost like every week I'm like, can, can we run trap this week? And then, uh, you know, I get scared off of it because they slant or they you know, sometimes will be in twos and now, and now I have to kill it. Uh, do you have any, any thought through trap? Have you, have you ran it much? Can you put oh, my yeah. mind at ease a little bit? Well, I'll tell you, you hit one of the most intriguing for true connoisseurs of run game balance which there's like eight of us out there, whatever, but for, the, for that small population, you hit the scheme that is most intriguing to me. And here's why. Because although it presents as a scheme with singularity of purpose, it in reality can accomplish both of those things depending on how you use it. The cognitive dissonance usually occurs when a guy doesn't understand that. And he's like, why can't I put it in? So I'll, I'll urge you to think of trap this way. And I love trap. We do run trap. Um, and it is a very hardy play. But if the guys that come in and say, I saw this team gash so-and-so on trap, I want to put it in. And then you say, okay, what front were they running it to? If they can't answer that question, <clears throat> then you just send them out of the room and finish game plan, right? Like, don't, don't even waste my time. <laughs> Seriously, because you have to recognize that if what you want it to be is a attitude play, then you have to be comfortable running that play until everybody wants to run it to the three technique and an even, even front with a, even number of down linemen and an even number of linebackers. And that's why everyone loved it in 1982, because that's all anyone was doing, right? But unless you're willing to run it to a one technique, a one five bubble, until you're willing to run it and make it a part of running it to an Oki front, a three, four, a true odd front with even linebackers, until you're willing to long trap run it into a two technique where you can either influence or do whatever you want, but run past that two technique, then it always remains in the finesse category of that scheme. Always. And don't tell me that. But if we're willing to commit the time to it, the greatest trap teams I've seen are not just running and we've been, we have to go against some teams, at least we used to, that were beautiful trap teams, better than I could ever hope to be. And they would run into the three, they would run into the one, they'd run into the zero five, they'd run into the two two, because they made it through belief to be their attitude play. And, and so you're talking power. And this is fascinating how trap fits like a puzzle piece into power. 
you're talking about the AGAP power. Is that what I'm assuming, right? Yes. Okay. So uh, full disclosure, we're more an outside power team. I love the power that balances toss to, to take care of the spills and the splatters and the re all that kind of stuff, right? So we are more uh, a C and D gap power team, which that, because it fits what we need to balance at that time. But for, you know, you brought up some of the, the great inside power teams. I think North Dakota State is, is that's, a, that's a great one. We've said it many times. If you are a true connoisseur of power, go look at Wisconsin 98, go look at Ron Dane, go look at Texas Longhorns and the, the guy, Ricky Williams. When, when teams are running the A gap or B gap power well, the inside power, there is a level of cutback that when, when Brady, when I asked you the question on our elevator clinic, when I asked you the question about who defends it well, you specifically mentioned teams that are willing to slant or move or come across the face of a leverage-based down block. And I'm paraphrasing, but am I pretty close? Yes, sir. Okay, cool. So if the teams that do that well, a gap power, some of the, I just listed some of the all time great running offenses in college football. They have a feel that the guy with the ball, the running back has of how he's going to fit it. Because when you commit to running the power, when you commit to running inside power, when they start bringing backside guys across the face of the play side leverage base blocks, that guy is able to put his play side foot in the ground and still be smooth enough to the line to get behind it. And you're the, the coordinator on the other side saying, where did he hit that ball? And you're like, backside A gap. What? What do you mean he hit it in the back? Right? Am I lying? Am I lying? Nope, completely right. Right. So the same exact thing. Boy, this is exciting stuff. I'm having a blast, by the way. The same exact thing happens on trap when you commit to it. You get that Schlesinger. You get that Makovica. By the way, I referenced Makovica earlier. I just realized it was Corey Schlesinger, number 40, who hit those two traps versus Sapp and those guys in 1994 in the fourth quarter. The predecessor to the Makovic brothers. Corey Schlesinger, sorry, put a pin in that one. Now we go back. Those guys were able to feel when the defense was over committing to the gap cancellation that the offense was willing to commit and come across their face and hit it backside. So the joke's in your hands. It just, it, it's what you want. If what you're looking for is a finicky play, then tag it to a check system. You run draw trap, run influence trap, but you know what? Stick to running it to eagle fronts with strong side or weak side reductions and check it to the open A. If what you're looking for is an FU play, oh boy, a play that, uh, forget you, that you're going to be able to run no matter what, uh, you might want to edit that one out. Then I would strongly suggest teaching your running back how to read the appropriate guy so when they take away your cheese, and get to the gap that you expect to block with leverage, he's able to get it backside and cause that to happen. Whew, that was fun. <laughs> I know you're like, this is the weirdest guy we've ever had on. <laughs> Not at all. That was fun. <laughs> oh, dude, we're, we're ta I'm taking notes. That's, that's the cool thing about this, Coach. You don't, you don't understand it. Like, we're, Harp and I, when we started this thing, and we talked a little bit about it, but he and I love it because we get to do four to six hours of clinic a week. So there's times you might hear it like go a little bit dead. He and I are literally writing stuff down. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. That's awesome. I, like I that. told you at the top of this whole thing, I said, I'm, I'm a human nature, human, you know, just trying to grow people. There's no doubt. But I can talk old line play for a minute. <laughs> I know that gets Coach Harper fired up. It cool. definitely does. It definitely does. Yeah. Well, I, I wish I wish I would have had a a cooler answer from you and and gave me uh, the way to be able to be perfect with it instead of uh, it's got to be our our play. But I I'm completely with you, Coach, and I I uh, completely understand that. Uh, probably won't be for us because we don't have the uh, the I guess the want for it to be the. Um, you know, for it to be the physical play, it's going to be more the finicky play for us. But Amen. Well, well now you know, though. Right, well, exactly. You know, right? So now you're not wasting time. And, you know, at least 
I'll say the same thing. I say 80% of the times that a player comes in the, the office with a question, the answer can simply be exactly what I'm going to tell you. At least now the bird's in your hand, right? The old pro, the bird's in your, you get to decide. You get to decide. Your own. Now you know. Exactly. Well, coach, you also talked about um, lead draw, or you talked about draw. I'm, I'm assuming lead draw because you were talking about it being your, um, you know, play off of ISO, or it could be a play off of, um, you know, ISO. I've been thinking about that play these past you know, few months now after watching uh, in, in the NFL. It was a, a big staple play for so long because so many teams were under center. Uh, but, but now it seems like uh, it's a little bit tougher because so few teams get under center. And even right. when they do, it's a, it's a play action shot. There's not a whole lot of, you know, seven step, five step drops from under center anymore, at least not in high school and college. Um, uh, have you guys been able to use some lead draw? Uh, if so, is, is that stuff that you're doing out of the gun? Is that stuff you're finding ways to do it out of under center? Because to me, it would be a great play for us, but most of the time we're under center. If we're going to throw it, it, it's some type of a play action, take a shot, you know, pass. But to answer the question, yes, yes, and yes. So, um, <clears throat> we, yes, we run it. Uh, I, I would, excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry. I would urge you to think about it maybe a little different way. It's not just in 1996, two back 21 personnel play um, with some quick. Re now, if, if you are looking at it that way, the guy to call up is John Stiglmeyer, who's the head coach of South Dakota State. And you say, hey, Stig, can you send me your film of Josh Ronick running lead draw in 1998? Because they ran it about as good as I've ever seen it to the tune of, I think he had two 2,000 yard seasons. But it's for us, most of our draw is actually one back to where we're going to employ one of our combo players. And that's a whole different conversation. But maybe a tight end, maybe a number two receiver, maybe a wing to block the play side inside linebacker. So, yeah, there's, you're right. If you're, you got a, a great, mind for conceptualization if you're thinking about ISO to draw infers I back lead draw because they're in the same plane. But I would also ask of you to think what are other ways that I could be in a two by two, a three by one, a one back with a wing, and I can still get that lead block to the other side. So for instance, we could be in 22 personnel and run sprint draw, and we could be in 10 personnel with a tight wing and still run it, but now I need our combo player, our number two, to block the responsibility of the insert player, which is the play side inside linebacker. Uh, and you might say, well, you're going to motion him into the backfield. No, I'm going to use time and circumstance to pause the feet of the other guy. And that's the pass action run game that we've done for 20 years. You know, everyone goes to the ends of the earth and they develop their play action pass game pass game that looks and feels exactly like the run game to take advantage of post-snap leverage with combo players that can't get underneath the areas they got to get. Why don't we ever think of the other way, using the pass game to set up the run game that looks and feels just like the pass game. So for us, it's not, I mean, beyond normal seated. We might start our one back draw off by <clears throat> making a bubble fake if it's a fast flow back or, or, or taking a three-step drop because the guy who, I need to get to who I don't have inherent pre-snap leverage on is going to also have a responsibility based off of the stimulus that the quarterback presents. Mm. So if the quarterback just turns his back and hands the ball off, well, that's going to be the second and 14 that, that I didn't call a good play because I don't have pre-snap leverage. And I didn't threaten his area of responsibility. So, but I promise you, if we have a linebacker whose key read progression is like most linebackers and he's not on a blitz pattern or something like that, and he has a combo responsibility, play the A gap. But if a quarterback passes, I want you to drop to the, the, the hook and then rally to the curl, whatever it might be. Then threaten that leverage post-snap so you can get a guy who doesn't have pre-snap leverage to be able to get chest to chest on that guy. And maybe it's not just a play that only presents as a two-back lead draw run play because you're right. If all you're doing is that, then you better have a really good play action pass game or else your balance is thrown off. So do, and you don't have to give us obviously answers or put it out there. So 
what worries me about something like that is obviously, like you said, uh, if he's back in coverage, he's got rules. But if he is blitzing now, you know, to me as an offensive line coach, I'm scared. Is that something you're putting on your offensive lineman or is that something you're letting your quarterback, you know, chunk it out there? Or is that a completely on you guys, you're, you're scheming and so you're putting it in uh, when the percentages say that, that he's going to be a guy that's dropping? No, man, you're the coach. I'm putting it on you. All the right play at the right time. I mean, I, I don't know. No, I'm not going to put it on, on our O line or anything like that. And we're going to end up. That's that's why I was saying that 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 might be a play that ends up second and 14. Gotcha. But it also might. It's finicky, right? So it, it's as you charted out. It still might be 6.5 yards, but the standard deviation from the average is greater. So no, it's on the coach. At some point, you got to make the call. But as long as you know where it fits and what to expect in your offense. I got to take a shot when it's second and 14 because I didn't do my job on first down. So I'm trying to do the job of two downs on one down. So of course I'm going to take on more. You know, that's, that's just uh, life. Yeah. Sometimes it doesn't work out. You know, we get sacked too. Coach, I know you mentioned, you know, the, the pass action runs. I know that was something when I was at, at Jinx, you know, I'd read a, a couple of articles that you'd put out and, and things that you guys had, had kind of started. And a lot of it, you know, was some of the, you know, look look to throw something out there make a guy you know that's in conflict have to play pass first and then run in some of the draws and it was always something I looked at you know trying you know maybe from the pistol where you could kind of hide the guy a little bit you know and, and and teams teams wouldn't be able to see him you know behind the quarterback and be able to run things you know like levels but just kind of figuring out and what would be the timing you know it's, it's going to be you know a three-step drop from the gun mm-hmm. back you know comes <laughs> off to the side and then we could run you know, whatever type of scheme we wanted on the backside, you know, be it lead draw, be it, you know, a counter play, you know, whatever it might be that kind of times it up. And, and I never really had the kahunas to do it, but it was always something I'm kind of like, man, this could be, you know, pretty good. What kind of, what kind of pushed you in that direction when you, you know, started looking at some of those and what was kind of maybe your favorite ones? Uh, when we would play games <clears throat> when I was eight and 10 years old at home, um, Growing up, I was the master of, of the bicycle game known as chicken. You guys know what chicken is? Oh, yeah. yeah yes. Right. So chicken is, and this is probably why our, our schemes are, are quite aggressive um, nowadays. It goes back to playing with my five or six boys and, and playing chicken. Is at some point, you have, to, you have to recognize and respect that the other side of the ball and the other person who you compete against in a zero-sum game we can't both get a pluses here right in order for me to get an a you got to get it get an f that's life man so at some point um if you respect that another person's decision making process has to go in it then to not utilize a a chance to threaten those other responsibilities because I would love nothing more than to, than to coach linebackers. But if you coach linebackers and you're saying, I'm going to make you a combo player, here's your two responsibilities. Play the A-gap, and if they pass it, go drop into the zone, right? I can't teach my left guard to go run a route if his guy's not rushing. So I look at that as cheating. You're cheating. He's not really cheating the linebacker. He's just playing a football. I get it. I'm not an idiot. But you, you are – you are that's that's how I look at things. I know it's it's not healthy. Don't um, it's it's you are stretching someone too thin. And my dad always used to say, Glenn, you can't put two pounds of sausage in a one pound casing. At some point, something's going to squirt out. So the same thing that allowed me to commit to my belief in the game of chicken circa 1986 is the same thing that makes me say. You know, I take that leap of faith and put it in. Now, let me be really clear. We're talking about pass act. This is not an entire offense. No. It is a small six to eight percent of a run game answer to put a guy in conflict. Why do we go to the ends of the earth to spread guys out 53 and the third year from sideline to sideline to put them in conflict pre-snap? Yet we don't give the same credence to put them in conflict post-snap. Makes no sense to me, right? So for us, I didn't at the time, when you're alluding to when you were Jenks, and, and I had 
probably talked a couple of times on the, on the circuit about pass action run. I had not even thought about the pistol. The pistol, had I known about it earlier, but I was, you know, living in the Dakota, so things took a few more years to get out to me, right? <laughs> I, would have, I would have definitely thought that was a perfect scenario because the guy who's getting the ball is still, literally, behind the guy who is receiving the ball from, from center. So I didn't even think about that. But don't think of it as... Don't think of it as a response to putting in a whole run scheme. And over the years, when people have reached out and said, I want to put the run, the pass action run offense in, you know, they reach out to you, they, oh, I can, but it's not an offense, man. It's an answer to how to take care of when you don't have pre snap leverage on a combo player on solo. Game. It's an answer to, I want to run power to a, a five nine surface. But their nine technique continues to wrong arm and spill. Okay, if you threw bubble out there, would he open his outside hip and run? Well, yes. Well, then fake a bubble out there and then hand it to him, and then he can't spill it or splatter it or wrong arm it. Like it's it's just the simple. Again, it's something I learned when I was eight years old and how to deal with human nature. Well, Coach, uh, obviously we could probably keep you on here for hours and and continue to talk run game and and football and philosophies, but want to also let you get back to the things that you've got going on. But but the last thing that that, uh, I always like to ask guys before we cut you loose is if you're watching another team's offensive line, what's some things they'd be doing that would make you think highly of their offensive line coach? Helmet placement and step two, like so simple. If if, – we can scheme all we want, but at the end of the day, step one is overcoached, and, and I am the biggest culprit in the world at coaching step one because it's it's so simple and it's the first step and you know that kind of thing. But more interior battles are won on step two than any other position by far. And I'm talking defensive line. Say I, whatever I would say for the O line. I would say for the D-line, as long as they're in the box and their hands are the game. So, but anyone can, can like a robot. I was, I was a robot. I was non-athletic. So turning me into a robot was actually a, an upgrade. So I could get step one in the ground. But it took the great coaches, the Larry Zarneckis. Uh, it took the, the, the coach, Coach Beagles. It took uh, Coach Bugle. It, it, those, coach McKittrick. If you watch some of the all-time greats the beauty lies in their second step and not over committing on step one and then the second thing i would look at is helmet placement i am a prime example my when i had to go to my first college football game i was a backup before i should have been and i wasn't good and our starter who was an all-american center my sophomore year gets hurt and we're down by nine points to albany i'll never forget it and Larry Zarnecki gets on the phones, and I know I got to go in. It's the opening game of the year. And he goes, Glenn, second quarter. He goes, I, I got to put you in, which that, that is not exactly what you want to hear. I have to put you in. It's not like, I'm going to put you in. <laughs> it's glad I got to put you in. And, and I was, I was, I'm always, I know who I am. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, always, I'm like, I get it, Coach. And he goes, now listen to me. He goes, I love you. You know I love you. I recruited you. I coached you. I love you. But for the next two hours, I need you to get beat as slowly as you absolutely can. Can you do that for me? And I said, yes, coach. And I went out there and I got my butt kicked slowly. And we won by five points. And it's a great reminder of if your helmet is in the right place, assuming that the rules allow us to put our helmet in the right place anymore, right? If the helmet is in the right place, you can get in a guy's way and lose him the right way and be very productive and maybe even start in college football, even though you're a nano, and maybe even build a program around an offensive line, even though you're not. And we're prime example of that. Coach Matt, it's been an absolute blast. I uh, want to give you kind of one last opportunity to talk a little bit about, you know, the, the St. Thomas program and, you know, where you guys are at and what you guys can offer, because we got a lot of coaches, you know, nationwide, and, and I think they'd, they'd love to learn more about what you guys have. Well. Um, I alluded to it earlier. I mean, we're, we're just blessed beyond what we deserve. We, we took over a program that was wanting and willing to be really good. <clears throat> and 
what we had they needed and what we needed they had. And it was really a, a beautiful fit. Um, we're a school of a little over 10,000, uh, Catholic school, largest Catholic school in the Midwest. Uh, we're in the Twin Cities, in the heart of the Twin Cities, in the prettiest tree-lined street you've ever seen. 93 majors, uh, med sc uh, law school, business school. It's, it's a, a, a tremendous place. But most importantly, it is a school that has a, a mission that could have been written by a football coach. Work skillfully for the common good. It's the second shortest mission statement in college. And it could have been written by a football coach, understanding that our job is to be very giving of ourselves, and to understand, to trust and have faith in the process and know that whatever comes is gonna be a byproduct and a result of that trust and that faith and that work. And um, I just, I wake up every day and I, I just shake my head at times, um, realizing how fortunate we have. And, and a lot of people are gonna point to the, the stuff and we are not a stuff team. And trust me, we got the stuff. We got the facilities, we got the wins, we got the record, the reputation. We are a program that values being able to teach the education of life through the sport of football. And if we can convince the guys to go play for this weird little Italian guy that talks more about human nature than down blocking a three technique, then I think we're in pretty good shape. So guys, thanks so much for having me on your service and what you do. It's not just your passion but it's the passion of so many others. And for you to serve our profession and our community in a very acute way, to be a bastion of, of, of an island where we can go and just talk football is unique and it's worthy. So thank you for what you do, guys. Appreciate you.